Megan Kelly, time now. One of the biggest stars of US broadcasting and host of the Must Listen podcast, The Megan Kelly Show, joins us with her unique take on American news and culture. Coming up shortly, Megan's verdict on the Sussexes and Oprah bagging a nomination for a Hollywood gong. But first, Megan, you, your podcast went a little bit viral this week after you said the media represented the events at the Capitol on January the 6th as so much worse than it actually was. Now, as ever, I thought it was a measured and nuanced argument from you. But the response uh, to your comments, maybe not so much. Yeah, well, that's true and nothing unusual, right? It's like, it, for some reason, Dana, you tell me there's something about me that really tweaks the mainstream media, especially here in the States. I think it's because they really, really want me to be on their side. And I'm not on their side. I'm on the side of the truth, which they find very irritating. They loved it when it, you know, resulted in a very tough question to President Trump at a debate or then Donald Trump at a debate. But they don't like it when it counteracts their narrative. And the truth is, they have been overplaying the story of January 6th. And I have, from the beginning, condemned what happened on Capitol Hill. I thought it was disgusting. It was upsetting. I, I do not carry any water for the people who went into that Capitol and committed crimes that day. However, the media has been breathlessly overplaying it since day one. And I give you as one primary example, the case of Officer Brian Sicknick. Brian Sicknick, we were told by the New York Times, right after this happened, a couple days after, who, who did die uh, a couple days after this happened, they told us that he died as a result of injuries sustained in fighting Trump supporters who bashed him with a fire extinguisher. It wasn't true. And even on the day the Times reported it, KHOU in Houston was reporting, having spoken with the Capitol uh, Police Union head on the record that he had died of a stroke. They ignored it. A month later, and by the way, in the meantime, everyone ran with the Times as reporting. Everyone. They breathlessly touted it. Why? Because it made the Trump supporters look like violent murderers there to unleash an insurrection, part of their narrative. A month later, the New York Times gets part of the story corrected. They don't announce a retraction. They don't announce a correction even. They take down the part about the fire extinguisher, but maintain he was killed and then succumbed to his injuries. Kill, he wasn't killed. He wasn't. He had a stroke two days after the act on, J on January 6th. But they wouldn't come to grips with it because, again, it undermined the narrative. Uh, and even then, CNN said well, it was bear spray. He was sprayed with bear spray, which may have caused the stroke. Not true. Once again, the narrative fell apart. Mm. No one owns these mistakes, right? They want it. Well, it was pepper spray. No, it wasn't. It was a stroke. Okay. It doesn't make it any better what happened on Capitol Hill that day, but there's no reason to keep overplaying your hand. And they did it time and time again. Glenn Greenwald, great reporter here, reported about Eric Munchell. They referred to him as a zip tie man. And from Reuters, uh, I think it was Washington Post, they issued reports saying he carried these zip ties into the Capitol with the intent of tying up lawmakers. Untrue. If you follow the case of this guy, his own prosecutors went to court and said, that's not true. He actually picked up the zip ties off of a table when he was in the Capitol. And it was pretty clear he was he didn't want the police to use them to handcuff protesters. But this was not part of some pre-planned plot to go in there and tie up lawmakers. Why does the media keep overplaying these stories? Because they like the narrative that condemns Trump supporters, that condemns Trump, that keeps him silent, that helps prevent him from trying to throw his hat into the ring in 2024. There are all sorts of reasons. But I think you can, you can have a truth-based assessment of what happened that day that it, it wasn't quite as bad as the media made it out yeah, to be. Indeed. It was not necessarily some huge insurrection. It was awful. But let's, let's lower the temperature and be honest, especially when we've made repeated, repeated mistakes that always go against one side. Yeah, because I, I, I mean, I've heard American commentators try to compare it to 9-11. And I just feel that is so offensive to the victims of 9-11. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. 3,000 people died in America that day, including children who were on those airplanes turned into missiles. Can you imagine what they felt as those planes were going into the World Trade Center? Women having to jump from the 90th floor of the World Trade Center, trying to maintain their dignity, holding down their dresses as they had to make a choice between being burned alive and jumping to their deaths. And don't tell me one death of an officer from a stroke and four other deaths from natural causes, except for Ashley Babbitt, who was a Trump supporter, yeah. shot by a cop compares to that. It doesn't. 
don't don't compare things to the Holocaust and don't compare things to 9-11. It's disrespectful to the victims. And they've already spoken out here in the States about, please stop doing that. I think it's grossly disrespectful. No, I completely agree. And, and, and Megan, you have an issue with the use of the word insurrection. Well, I mean, insurrection is a term here that is traditionally akin to treason. I mean, it's it's legally it's sort of in the field of treason. The punishment for treason legally is death, Dan. You know what the pun- what the suggested sentences are of the crimes that they're bringing against these protesters now, the most severe ones? Like three years. <laughs> it's not death. This it wasn't an insurrection. What they say is an armed insurrection. And I realize people made makeshift weapons out of flagpoles. Some had some did have sprays, pepper sprays and other sprays. Some used flagpoles and so on. I again, I'm not carrying water for those people. But as far as I can tell, there was no one in the Capitol with a weapon brandished trying to use it on anybody in and around the around the Capitol. There were a couple guys found with guns. But they make it sound like people stormed the Capitol, guns drawn, zip ties out, ready to capture AOC. This this didn't actually match up with the facts as they played out. And and you can honestly report that without taking away from the awfulness of that day. But what happens is things like the New York Times story with the fire extinguisher get printed that winds up in the impeachment documents against Donald Trump. And even uh, President Biden continued to tout it af- long after it had been debunked. And media here continue to link to that New York Times report because it wasn't retracted. It wasn't corrected uh, as though it's still true. And I mean, I could go on. There are many other examples. And this is the same media, Dan, that when they were reporting on the BLM riots over the summer of 2020, I mean, I know how they how they are very capable of hyping a story if they want to, because you look at January 6th and very capable of downplaying it because you look at the BLM riots where 19 people were killed. Okay, nine. And and they were mostly peaceful protests, Megan, as 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 we saw fire bombs thrown into businesses burning to the ground. That's right. 19, and most of those pe- 19 people were shot to death. 2,000 police officers were injured. $2 billion of damages were caused. Over 40 cities were in lockdown thanks to curfews that were imposed. So that was a rather big deal. And yet we got mostly peaceful. The New York Times, I, th- I wrote it down here. It was something, oh, they said um, these were the riots, isolated incidents of looting and sometimes property destruction. Really? That's how they describe those riots. But the Capitol Hill is an insurrection, seditionists, armed. It's, you see my point? I'm just trying to stay with totally. the truth here without diminishing the violence we saw in either incident. Totally. Uh, now, look, Megan, uh, critical race theory seems to continue to be dividing America. This week, Randy Weingarten, who is the head of the American Federation of Teachers, said that Republicans are bullying educators to try to stop them teaching honest history. What did you make of that? Well, it's kind of awesome what happened with the teachers unions here, because the number one and the number two largest teachers unions first tried to play critical race theory? No, we're not report. We're not doing that. Our teachers are not. We, huh? Who? What? We never heard of that. Uh, and then so apparently somebody didn't get the memo because when the largest teachers association had its um, annual meeting earlier in July, they unveiled their big plan, their big legal defense fund for any teacher who gets sued for teaching what they believe in, which is critical race theory. <laughs> somebody didn't get the memo about, oh, we're not supposed to admit that we're teaching that. They are teaching it. Um, in fact, an NBC poll of teachers just re- recently showed that the, ma- the majority of teachers either want to teach it or feel it should be mandated in classrooms. And most of us parents here, including myself, have lived it. And I, part of the problem is that critical race theory is this sort of blanket term that's meant to encompass a lot of the indoctrination that we're getting right now on race. And it may not line up perfectly with the, co- with the academic theory that was once taught and still is taught in law schools. But people understand what that means. They're, they're, they're stereotyping people based on the color of their skin. And if your skin happens to be white, uh, you are shamed for acts that happened hundreds of years ago over which you have no control. That's what they're trying to stop. The teachers want to teach that, not American history, not Jim Crow era, not slavery. That's been taught. It's, it continues to be taught. In the past year, these teachers have changed the narrative entirely to shaming the children who have white skin, not to mention little boys for their gender. And that's what the parents are trying to stop. The teachers unions have to listen to us. You know what? 
public education, they have to, the curricula is set by school boards, sorry, and states. This is an area in which it's not a huge free speech zone. So they may not like it, but they have to listen to the school boards and to the parents who actually ultimately control them. When you spoke with the uh, comedian Chrissy Mayer on your podcast this week, it was a really fascinating interview sort of about the state of comedy and, and cancel culture. I was very struck uh, by something she said. She said, you should be able to do your job as a comic without cursing or being super graphic or being super gross, but words aren't dangerous. Words only have the danger and the value that you give to them. And I thought it was such a good point. But at the moment, comedians are being cancelled all across the world for simply doing their job. Mm -hmm. She made a great point. And she was talking about how she's been kicked out of certain clubs and off of certain invite lists because she's come out as a Trump supporter. She voted for the Green Party nominee four years earlier, yeah. Jill Stein, who got about four votes, one of which was Chrissy's. And uh, then, then she voted for Trump. But she was describes herself as a lifelong liberal Democrat feminist until she started to see the crackdowns on free speech and you can't say this. And she's like, what, what are we doing? What are we, what? And that's ultimately, I think, what led to her becoming a Trump supporter, right? And, and we've seen this in comedy where, A, you can't be a Trump supporter and get hired in, in many of these places. And B, you certainly can't be something like a, a white man and get it, and get a job as a comedian. I mean, Ryan Long was on my show not long before that. He's a Canadian comedian. He's hilarious. He was saying, his uh, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation said to him, I mean, obviously you're hilarious, but there's clearly no way you're getting a show because you're a white guy. I mean, they're open about it, right? And meanwhile, you've got people like Stephen Colbert, Jimmy Kimmel here in the States. As long as you're a Trump basher, your evening spot is secure. Even if your numbers are terrible, their ratings are in the toilet. Greg Gutfeld, who's over on Fox News, who is actually really funny, but comes at things from more of a right wing angle. I mean, he's unpredictable, but he's definitely more conservative. He's beating them. They're on network news. Network news pops up for free in every home in America. Cable you have to subscribe to. He's beating them. Why? Because there's an audience for people who A, aren't always political and B, might come at these issues from a different angle. Dave Chappelle, same thing. There's a reason he get, he's getting $20 million per episode from Netflix because he's not towing the line and he doesn't see any sacred cows. He'll go after anything the way it used to be, Dan. Yep, no, and I think that's right. And I hope uh, that Chrissy gets the work because she deserves to get the work because she, she's very funny. Now, uh, yeah. Megan, are, are podcasters and, and radio hosts going to start running the world? Uh, Larry Elder has entered the Californian recall election. Uh, this is relatively significant, isn't it? What does it all mean? Now it's getting interesting. Larry is amazing. Larry is the son of a janitor uh, his dad was raised in the Jim Crow South and he's a black man. And Larry got him, he pulled himself up, moved himself on, went to Brown University, very well respected, very liberal, very left leaning. And then I think Michigan Law School got a job with a big law firm, started doing commentary, popular radio show and so on. And uh, Larry is one of those sort of bootstrap kind of guys who's like, I can. And what's important about me is my positive attitude. And he has the success and lifestyle to prove it. So Larry, by the way, if you haven't seen his movie, you can get it online, Uncle Tom, please do. It is gripping and it's so well done. And it's got a bunch of people with heterodox views when it comes to Black Lives Matter and reparations and all these messages. Um, he's the ideological godfather, I'd say, of Candace Owens. And Candace would say that she's very well known here too. Yeah. So he's gonna throw sort of you know a new voice into this recall effort and could really change the dynamic because, you know, I mean this in the political way, he's a sexy candidate. You know, he's interesting, yeah. he's fiery, and California's a hot mess. So we'll see if the, if the voters are ready for a big change from Gavin Newsom. Do as I say, not as I do, as he sneaks off for $1,000 dinners at French Laundry while he's making Californians sit in their, in their kitchens with the doors locked. It's amazing, Megan. Uh, it seems like he's been following our leaders over here who want to institute really <laughs> draconian lockdown policies, but then get up to whatever they want behind closed doors at uh, Downing right. Street or, or in their ministry. Thee, but, not <laughs> yeah. but but why why is this recall election taking place, Megan? Can you just explain the process? 
Well, I mean, they need to have two votes. You had to, you have to declare whether you're running by July 16th, I think it is. And there'll be two questions on the ballot. Number one, do you want to recall Gavin Newsom? And okay. only if they get a majority of yeses to that, do they move on to, to see what the answers were on question two? If so, who do you want to replace him with? Caitlyn Jenner, you know, yeah, yeah, Bruce yeah. Jenner um, is, is one of the candidates. Uh, Larry Elder and uh, a businessman, uh, I think the former San Diego mayor is also on there. So they're, they're just going to sort of try to hash it out and see who might be able to replace him if they can get a majority to replace him. And what the left is worried about in, in California is people may not be paying attention to this. You know, they, they still are in the midst of COVID lockdown hell over there in California. And um, there are a lot of liberals who are ticked off at Gavin Newsom, especially because of his hypocrisy and the French laundry and all of that. So there's a chance he could go down either because people are genuinely mad and or because they're not paying close enough attention. And the right wing is very motivated right now and sort of smells blood in the water. So it'll be fascinating to see who they put in there. I mean, unlike Caitlin, Larry's been living politics his whole life. He's a deep thinker on a lot of issues. I had him on my show. We talked about so many important things. And then you'll laugh at this after he uh, left. He sent me a bunch of merch from Uncle Tom, like an Uncle Tom t-shirt and Uncle Tom. And I laughed. Can you imagine walking around the Upper West Side of New York wearing me, wearing Uncle, uh, an Uncle Todd t-shirt? I didn't, but I appreciated the gesture. Now, Kate, Caitlyn Jenner, obviously a member of the Kardashian clan, huge name recognition. How do you think she'll go? I don't know. She's had a bit of a rocky start. Um, I think Republicans generally like Caitlyn, but, you know, she's a Republican. That was the biggest coming out she had. Forget being trans. And when she admitted she was a Republican, that's really where she fell apart with the with the left. Um, she's she kind of fallen down. She, she admitted she didn't even vote in the presidential election. And there were some important ca uh, California ballot initiatives on there, which she didn't even seem to know existed. And they were they were big ones. Like, should we be able to discriminate against on the basis of again, on the basis of race? Ultimately, California voters said, no, we should not. But she didn't know about it. Uh, so she she's had some stumbles. And she hasn't made much of a splash. And she's notwithstanding the fact that, of, of course, everybody, you know, once knew her as Bruce and she's part of the Kardashian clan and all that stuff. She hasn't made much of a splash. Um, and so we'll see. I don't know. I think within Republican circles, Larry's probably more beloved. Yes, we'll see if Kim Kardashian or her ex-husband, Kanye West, endorse Caitlyn. That could help. Mm, that could. You never know. I don't, you know. We'll see. I, I still have my questions about California, which is a very blue state, which has had Republican governors in the past, is going to recall this this governor. You know, if you look at him on paper, he's straight out of central casting, former mayor of San Francisco. It worked for Arnold Schwarzenegger, didn't mayor. it? So maybe it could work yeah. for Caitlyn Jenner. Uh, and look, finally, Megan, I found this absolutely extraordinary. Harry, Meghan and Oprah, that interview that we've spoken about so much and contains so much fiction, has ended up being nominated for an Emmy for Best Nonfiction Series. Oh, the irony, Meghan, the irony. It's absurd. And, and, you know, let's say these nominations came out the day after the interview. Maybe you give them a pass. The Emmys, they didn't have a chance. B.S. Because you now we know that not only did Meghan Markle tell a bunch of whoppers in that interview, but that night during the interview, Dan, I was tweeting out, I wanted more follow-ups. Why didn't she ask who, who in the royal family, for, for example, was jealous of Kate after the Australia tour? Who, or, or was jealous of Meghan? Who in the royal family said the thing about skin color? Get specific. If she doesn't want to answer, ask two or three follow-up questions. That's a huge allegation. And even her saying that she was married, you know, three days before she had the actual wedding, Oprah had time between the interview and the day it aired. They spent days and days editing that piece. As a journalist, you can find out. You call the archbishop. You, you can ask questions and get real answers and include in your report, we went to the archbishop and asked, and this is what we found. That wasn't quite true. None of that was done. That this is about celebrity and trying to celebrate, you know, these two women who are women of color, you know, speaking their truth, even though it was an actual truth. You know, we're supposed to be with a lived experience, even if, if it bears no relation to actual reality and celebrate them. If you're not pro all of that, Dan, you're a racist, sexist pig. <laughs>
So vote for someone else. Oh, my goodness. I would love to see Meghan Kelly versus Meghan Markle. That's where it would be at. <laughs> it would be fascinating, yeah. Meghan. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favorite shows, and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.